which contained, as you doubtless spotted, the words that we read from the screen at the beginning of the service, which is one of the prophecies relating to Jesus' birth, relating to the Incarnation. I wanted you to hear it in context, because as you may have noticed, it's in a very dramatic context. The prophet is talking about the instruments of war, the, the, the yoke of oppression, the rod of beating people, all of these instruments of war being done away with and the great victory being brought by nothing less than a tiny baby. And then he goes on to give names to that baby, prophetic names to the baby. And in the second part of our teaching this morning, what I want to do is to understand some of these special names that were given for Jesus. You see, prophecy is very interesting because you only really recognise it in retrospect. We recognise this as a prophecy because we can look back with the benefit of hindsight and we can see the way in which Jesus himself is described so wonderfully in this passage. For example, he's called the Wonderful Counselor. And this Wonderful Counselor is the sort of person that I need when I need advice. The Queen, I'm sure you're aware, has a group of privy councillors. Spelt not council, C-I-N, as if they meet in a committee, although there is the privy council. They're councillors, they're people who give advice. And they're a group of, uh, of well-respected people whose minds may think differently so that the reigning monarch can have sagely advice and impartial uh, and, and impartial insight into the situations that she faces. That's the, the, the idea behind the Privy Council. One day Solomon, of course, was asked by God, what would you like me to give you? I'll give you any Christmas present. Well, he didn't use the word Christmas present. I'll give you any present you like. And Solomon said to God, you know, Lord, I want you to give me wisdom. And the Lord said to Solomon, well, because you've asked for wisdom and not sought riches or wealth or fame, I'll give you wisdom. And in fact, these other things, the riches, the wealth and the fame, will follow on after. And sure enough, they did. And Solomon, in his heyday, was the wisest king that people ever saw. And, and he was revered for the sort of wisdom that God had, had placed within him. We need wise counsellors. But not only that, we see here... Jesus described as the mighty God. God's wisdom is supreme. And his might is irrefutable. And I need a mighty God when I need new strength. There's a, one of the very popular TV shows on. It's uh, screened on BBC One and lots of other places. It's The World's Strongest Man. I don't know whether, or Britain's Strongest Man. I don't know whether you've ever seen it. These men who, in, in fact, I think technically are morbidly obese, a lot of them, but, but, but it's all muscle. And you should see them lift and push and pull things. It's quite extraordinary. But their physical power, of course, pales into insignificance when we think about the power of Almighty God. When the, uh, when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and announced that she would conceive a child without the involvement of a man, his response was this, for nothing is impossible with God. And when Jesus was ministering later on, after comparing the, the difficulty of a rich man getting into heaven with a camel passing through the eye of a needle, Jesus said this, What is impossible with man is possible with God. With God all things are possible. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The whole message of Christmas is that Jesus comes in as the mighty God to whom we can turn when we need strength. And at the second service, at Reflections, we're going to be unpacking some of these, these areas about what it means for God to be very strong. Not only was Mighty God one of the special names that was attributed to Jesus, so also was Everlasting Father. A bit odd when you think he's a baby, don't you think? 
And yet here is Isaiah prophetically looking forward to the character, the Messiah who is going to come and say, this is going to be an everlasting father. And I need an everlasting father when I need to know that I'm loved. Now I'm well aware that the whole concept of fatherhood conjures up different ideas in different ones of us. For, for most of us, I expect our fathers were good and helpful people. But for some, of the, for some of us, our fathers were not. Our fathers may have been abusive or aggressive or just absent. Did you know that in the UK today, if you looked around, the average 16-year-old, the average 16-year-old is more likely to have a television in their bedroom than they are a father in their house. And that bothers me. Because I believe as Christians we want to stand for healthy family life and at the same time recognise the pain that it causes when families break down. When, um, uh, when John was writing about this whole aspect of God's fatherhood, he said this, Look at the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. When you became a Christian, assuming that you have been, when you became a Christian, you entered a new family. In the same way that Jesus, when he was born, he entered a different family. When, when you were born again, you entered the family of God. And Jesus entered an earthly family so that you and I can enter a heavenly one. We have a Father who loves us more than anyone else possibly could on this earth. Now my father has died. I don't have him around anymore to give me sagely advice and the occasional kick up the backside. But what I do have is a heavenly father who loves me dearly and who always looks out for, for me and wants the best for me and that's what your heavenly father is like. So many people today think that God is a negative and vindictive character and that we are like small ants and the one thing that God delights on doing is stamping, stamping on us or, or making us suffer. That's not the picture of God that we get in the Bible. What we see here is a God who loves and loves and loves. So much so that Jesus would even give his life for people like us. The measure of love that God gave us was the death of his only son. Now look at the love that the Father has lavished upon us, that we should be called the children of God, and that's what we are. God is our Father par excellence, and he was shown in the birth of Jesus. But then also, we notice these special names for Jesus are completed with this phrase, the Prince of Peace. Today, peace is in short supply. You don't need me to remind you that there is conflict going on in Syria and in Afghanistan. Even today, lives are being shared. We are uncomfortably conscious that this world is not a peaceful place. But it's not just the world out there where there is an absence of peace. Very often, it's the world in here. Some of us wrestle with feelings of insecurity, of not fe feeling that we're worth anything. And yet God comes in and he says, I'm, I'm your mighty God. You matter to me. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And that brings us peace. Peace with God because of the forgiveness we obtain in Christ. And peace with ourselves. Because finally, I can be made into the person that God intended me to be. Jesus came to bring peace. And a peace that goes far deeper than the absence of conflict. Jesus said, my peace, I leave with you. Like you, you, know, like you might leave something in a will. My peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give to you. It's there for us to receive. And he went on to say, it's not the kind of peace that the world gives. It's not just the absence of conflict. So, don't let your hearts be troubled. My peace, I leave with you. And then right at the end of that reading, having read these, discovered these four remarkable names for Jesus, 
there's another extraordinary statement. It says this, that God is an enthusiast. Now sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes I find myself thinking, well, you know, God is very cool, calm and collected. He's sitting in the executive office of the universe. Nothing is going to phase him. But here we have a slightly different picture. We see God as very enthusiastic. It says, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, the enthusiasm, the passion of the Lord of hosts, will make this happen. Will bring this baby to birth. As the wonderful counsellor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. God's enthusiasm, his passion is going to make it happen. I don't know about you, but we tend to remember people for what they were passionate about. At least I do. I mean, what do you remember Patrick Moore for? Astronomy. What do you think about Brian Cox for? You don't know Brian Cox, do you? <laughs> nuclear physics. He's a brilliant nuclear physicist. And you hear him talk, you think, oh, how obvious is that? He's often on, on TV. Follow him on Twitter, he's quite funny. Um, Jessica Ennis... A passion for athletics. And so it goes on and on and on and on and on. Well, here is God's passion. His passion is to bring to being the wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. His passion is to see people like you and me made more like his son because he sent his son to earth and we can now see him and emulate him and follow him and give our lives to him. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish all this. It was the zeal, the passion, the enthusiasm of God that brought Jesus into the world because he loves you and me that much. That, that is the incarnation. Rich, I'm going to hand back to you.